What is up? Welcome to the Walk Show Podcast. This is your host, Walker Near. Uh, up front, I want to mention that you can follow me on Twitter at The Walk Show Pod, Instagram and Facebook at The Walk Show. Uh, you can also email me at walker at the walk show podcast.com. Sometimes when I'm talking to people uh, about the show, they'll, they'll tell me that they you know, wish they could interject into the show and you know join the conversation. Um, well, obviously, that's not possible <laughs> with the pre-recorded interviews. Um, certainly, you're always welcome to, to hit me up at any of those places. And, and obviously, if you just know me already, you can hit me up there, too. But um, if you hit me up on somewhere like Twitter or something like that, then we might be able to get more people involved in the conversation. Also, if you like the show, please take a moment to like, rate, subscribe, whatever your app lets you do uh, to, to, per, to you know, rate the show, because uh, it helps the show be more discoverable so some more people can, can know about it. Um, I also want to shout out my other podcast, which is called Pick Up Your Sticks, which is co-hosted by myself and multiple time The Walk Show podcast guest, Brett Lindley. Um, Pick Up Your Sticks is actually a podcast about video games, uh, but instead of doing reviews or, or news updates, we discuss why gaming matters. Um, you know, obviously, The Walk Show previously has had some some episodes on gaming, and uh, instead of continuing to kind of sprinkle those in, uh, Brett and I thought it made sense to just kind of start our own thing. So, so that's what we did. So if you like gaming and enjoy you know thoughtful conversations about that, then, then it should be right up your alley. Before we move on to today's episode, I do want to talk about something I recently saw. Uh, it's on Netflix. It's called Inside Bill's Brain, Decoding Bill Gates. It's actually a, a documentary series. It's, a, I think, three episodes, about an hour long each. Um, and I just found it really, really, I, I guess, inspiring is the right word or, or <laughs> comforting uh, to some extent. Um, Bill Gates, obviously, a very, very popular figure and uh, for a while was kind of a polarizing figure, although I think that has largely diminished uh, to, at this point. Um, obviously, the, the founder of Microsoft and uh, since his departure from Microsoft so over a decade ago, he has been fully committed to philanthropy with his foundation, which is the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, and so each episode of this documentary series it, it you know it, it talks about Bill Gates' life kind of as a child, and it, it shows clips from from the early years of Microsoft, and, and eventually into the later years of Microsoft, um, and all of that is kind of mixed throughout. So it's not it's not in chronological order throughout each episode necessarily. Um, so it might start out talking about who Bill Gates was as a kid, and then it might jump to present time. And each episode kind of deals with a different global uh, problem that he is is striving to solve. Um, and the first one, he he is the first episode. He's the problem he's striving to solve is um, the fact that there is not plumbing in most of the undeveloped world, and in places like like let's say India, for example, where maybe you have and. I know India has some very developed parts, so I don't mean to imply that, that everywhere there is, is a shanty town, but there are regions at least that are very densely populated and already have all of the, the structures, the, the homes that people are living in. And it's just not really feasible to try and implement a plumbing system that we have, like in the United States, for example, it would take an enormous amount of time and just the cost of it is very prohibitive. And so Bill Gates um, decided to to try and, and solve the problem. And, and, and to, to clarify further, I guess the problem with not having uh, plumbing is that these people are using the restroom in, in what's called a pit latrine, which is basically just a hole in the ground. Well, that hole gets disgusting, obviously. And so then they don't want to go in there and or don't want to go to where that is and use it. So then they go somewhere else or... Maybe they do use that and they clean it out, but then when it gets cleaned out, there's not a treatment facility for the waste to be taken to. And so in the end, it ultimately is going into the ground, the groundwater, the, the, the water supplies. Um, and it's a huge, it's a huge cause of, of disease um, and infection. And he talks about how, you know, he, he was reading a story where there, there's all these people dying from all these babies and, and young children dying from diarrhea. And it just, it kind of stunned him because, you know, in the United States, diarrhea is not something that people die from. Uh, it's definitely very preventable and treatable. And 
it's not something that if, if anyone catches it or you know has it, if you will, I don't know if catches the right word, but but has it, you don't think that they're going to die from it. And so he set out to try and correct that that problem, um, which I thought was you know obviously <laughs> commendable. Um, and it and it, it so what he did was he holds this engineering fair and has people submit all of these ideas on on ways that that toilets could be done that are totally different and totally beyond what is currently done um and so i mean you've got people that are create like one one group created a toilet that requires no external water it runs completely on the the waste and it converts the waste and and processes it so that the byproducts when it, when it's done when you flush if you will is um it creates a little pile of ash and it creates drinkable water and the whole thing again runs independently um, now a lot of these ideas are also in and of themselves at this point still cost prohibitive uh, because it's you know prototypes basically but it, it was just so 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 refreshing <laughs> to see someone like bill gates who is incredibly powerful um given his resources and also just actually incredibly smart like after <laughs> After watching this, which I get that it, you know Bill Gates participated in it, and I'm sure is involved heavily in the production, so of course it's going to be flattering to him to some extent. But I honestly think that he might just be smarter than most people. Um, and so, anyway, it's just really refreshing to see someone who's that smart and has that many resources committing themselves to really trying to help people and help the world solve problems that shouldn't they don't have they shouldn't be problems anymore because they're not problems. United States, for example. So why does it have to be true only here that, that you don't have to worry about your child getting sick and, and, and not being around anymore because of diarrhea, right? Um, and in any way, it was just, again, it was, especially with American politics as it is now, and, and I, you know, I, I, certainly, <laughs> I certainly don't blame Trump for all of the world's problems or something, but, and, and honestly, it's not just him, it, you know, whether it's it's him or whether it's the people that are attacking him constantly, like everything is always a catastrophe. Everything is always everything is always bad, but it's always it's always kind of stupid, you know. Like it's always petty stuff. It's always insignificant things, and it's not it's not someone really leaning into trying to do this do this kind of philanthropy. Um, and you know, you look at someone like Jeff Bezos who runs Amazon and that dude's the richest man in the world. And he donated like, I think a hundred million to charity last year, which to be clear, a hundred million dollars is actually inconceivable to me. Of course, I've never seen anything even approaching that kind of money uh, and likely never, <laughs> never will. But for him, it's a very small portion of what he could be contributing, right? Or Steve Jobs, who's heralded as this great American visionary. Well, you know, the, there's there's not there's not some huge Steve Jobs initiative that's going on still even after his passing that that is carrying on his charity work because it doesn't exist um at least not in the capacity that the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation exists um and yeah and so each episode kind of tackles another issue uh, like that um I just really, really suggest that that you go watch it. And again, you know, I, I, I said the word Trump. So now maybe this is offensive to some or everyone <laughs> uh, who's listening. But it, again, it's just so nice to see someone trying to help people and committing their life to, to doing it. Another one of the episodes, he's looking at, at climate change, which I'm, I'm sorry, is a thing that's happening. And um and so he looks at nuclear power, which has a pretty bad stigma. You know, you've got things like Chernobyl or most recently the Fukushima in, in Japan where, you know, it, it went really bad and it's scary. Well, the point that he tries to make is that <laughs> those nuclear facilities were designed when when computers didn't exist yet they they, they call them slide rule technology it's for, it's literally 1940s designs and one guy in, in the documentary says in 70s implementations that are being used and so yeah there are some really significant risks but it's also possible to design something now that is 
much safer and that eliminates the vast majority of that risk. Um, and he goes on to actually, again, contract out or you know hire out whatever, bring in people to assist with that. And, and these people come up with some brilliant designs. I mean, they come up with a nuclear reactor that can run on depleted uranium. So it no longer requires it to be weapons grade uranium, right? So then not only is it potentially solving problems with climate change, but it's also solving nuclear weapons to some extent, you know, or at least helping to curb the, the, the correlation between, well, if we want this clean energy solution, now we also have to, you know, look down at the fact that we're, we're also maybe having more nuclear weapons. Well, not with this design. Um, He's also committed in another in the other episode a huge amount of his time and resources to trying to literally eradicate polio. Um, polio is a really horrible disease that in the United States is pretty much gone, right? But not in the rest of the world. And and so it's just again it's just so cool to see, so refreshing. And he, you know, he he doesn't try and paint himself to be this like, you know. Um, person who has all of the answers as much as he's a person who has not all of, but a significant amount of resources and the willingness to to try and the willingness to recruit other people who also can contribute to, to try and, and tackle these problems. Um, so anyway, uh, enough of my rambling about Bill Gates, but uh, inside Bill's brain, decoding Bill Gates, it's on Netflix. Highly recommend that you check it out. And uh, I think that you will find it to be really interesting, engaging, and, uh, and, and hopefully, you know, a bit, a bit refreshing. Um, I think that Bill Gates later in, in the future will be looked at differently than he is now among his contemporaries. I mean, not that people don't already hold him in high regard now, but I think as we move forward in time and, you know, he's a couple generations back. I think Bill Gates is going to going to be kind of re- regarded as someone who really really helped move the world forward and and not just because of these things but also because of the work he did with Microsoft and because of the way that Windows kind of standardized PCs and made it so that everyone was was kind of using the same thing whereas if you look at like cell phones for example that don't have one leader like that you have this fragmentation uh, now, obviously, smartphones thrive, and so <laughs> we survived that as well. Um, but I think that, you know, computers was a huge shift in tech, and especially the internet, a huge shift in technology. And I think that having that standardized platform really helped that adoption and for that to become something that, that was accessible for, for lots and lots of people to, to become familiar and comfortable with. Moving on to today's show. Uh, on today's show, I am joined by Ashley Thomas, who is the owner of the Queen Beyond the Wall, Ashley Thomas Coaching. Um, she is a, a life coach and uh, and is really just an awesome person and was a lot of fun to talk to. Um, I'm really excited about, uh, about our conversation and I think you'll enjoy it. Um, so without further ado, let's jump into it. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Walk Show podcast. And Ashley, welcome to the Walk Show. Thank you so much for joining. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm well. Thank you for asking. Um, so I actually was introduced to you by Stacy Johnson, who was a guest on my show a, a few episodes back. Um, and she runs a, a life coaching business. Um, and then she had, after we recorded that, and, and I, I think you had maybe heard that episode, um, she thought that it would be fun for us to to get together and talk because you also run a a, a coaching business. Um, I, in talking to Stacy about it, she explained that it because initially I thought she had said it was you know really mo- mostly focused on relationships, but she said it really kind of branches out into a, a pretty wide variety of areas. Um, so if you don't mind, just kind of explain what what the business is all about. Right. So coaching, um, life coaching is 
someone, a life coach is someone to support you in finding your own answers. So coaches help clients discover what it is they actually want, what's keeping them from getting there, and what they can do to successfully change, motivate, clarify. Um, mm -hmm. They can provide accountability, which can come in handy, um, because sometimes making big, big life changes is challenging. Um, and I specialize, um, I'm, I'm trained in functional medicine, health and wellness coaching, but because of the nature of functional medicine, it's kind of a whole person. So you're not just a, a symptom or a disease or your weight or your blood pressure. You're a whole person with relationships and dreams and people who mean things to you and things you want to do. So that's sort of my area. Gotcha. Well, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, so, uh, you know, I guess actually one question that popped into my mind and forgive my ignorance, but w w how would you define functional medicine or what is that term meant to imply? Right. So functional medicine is integrative medicine. It's a philosophy of the practice of medicine where you treat the person and not the symptom mm. and you treat the, the whole person rather than finding a disease, giving a pill, um, and, and treating that you, it's also sometimes described as upstream medicine. So okay. it's, it's seeks to find the cause, the root cause rather than just treat the symptom. And it also seeks not just to, to treat people when they're in a state of dis-ease, but to prevent it because it's easier to prevent than to treat. Um, and also it seeks to not focus so much on just disease and not even on health, but vibrant health, um, mm. vibrant health and well-being. And that's emotional, mental, spiritual, physical health and well-being. So that's what functional medicine does. Okay. So yeah, another question that I had kind of had, but I think maybe you, you just answered, but we'll see if I, if I understood or not. Um, I was going to say, so, you know, how would you, how would you, I guess, compare and contrast coaching to versus like, you know, a, a, a counselor that you would see at like a mental health kind of place. But it sounds like even that is, is more focused on just kind of one thing. Whereas what you're offering with the functional medicine and not just you, I'm sure there's, you know, obviously there's lots of people that are involved in it, but, um, but it, it it's looking like you just said at the whole picture. So if I, let's say I came to you and I was depressed, well, maybe if I'm talking to a counselor, they're just going to try and explore emotionally why I feel that the way I do. But with functional medicine, you know, that might be a part of it, but then perhaps I have a physical thing, like maybe I'm, you know, which I am overweight, for example. So then maybe, maybe you would find reasons that that is also contributing to the depression or, or something along those lines. Does that make sense at all as an example or? Yes, that's, that's definitely a part of it. Um, and sometimes the tools that a, that a coach and a therapist use overlap. Mm. Um, but, but what they do is different. So, um, a therapist is trained to deal with um, mental illnesses um, and a coach takes people who are not necessarily, they're not necessarily treating a, a mental illness. Um, they're helping them achieve their best life. So you can see how those things can overlap mm -hmm. and a, a coach and a therapist can uh, both be working with a client. If someone does have um, say, clinical depression and they need a trained therapist um, or if they have an actual eating disorder and they need a therapist um, that can be done in conjunction with coaching um, and then you can have the coach for sort of accountability um, checking in and the the trained therapist to deal with more serious issues the way that I heard it described to me which which made a lot of sense to me was one of the coaches that trained me said um, that the 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 therapist seeks to um comfort um mm. the uncomfortable mm. and therapists seek to make the comfortable uncomfortable 
to sort of like if you're training for a marathon, your trainer is going to, you know, push you a little. And it's, it's that sort of a dynamic. Right. So the, the, so, so the, the therapist is trying to make the, the uncomfortable comfortable, whereas the coach really is trying to maybe take someone out of their comfort zone and, and help them overcome something that they're uncomfortable with by kind of diving in or exposing them to that, whatever that thing is. Right. That's exactly it. And gotcha. yeah, you definitely have it. And yeah, for, so for someone who is, is on a weight loss journey, um, that that's something that a, a coach would, would definitely also be able to talk about emotional eating or triggers or um, another thing about coaching that's slightly different from some forms of therapy, although therapy has been moving in this direction is um, coaching is present and future focused, right? Mm. You create a vision and you create the steps to the vision. And, and by you, I mean, the client does that. It's sure, client centered. Sure. Um, and so there's, there's not so much delving into maybe childhood issues, childhood traumas that I really, I really feel that might be more of the domain of a, a trained therapist rather than, sure. than a coach. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and, you know, certainly I'm <laughs> neither therapist nor or coach, so <laughs> I don't mean to act like that. But um, I think that there's, you know, certainly there are a lot of, not that any of it's illegitimate, but there there are a lot of things that probably do require that more specialized kind of almost medical approach to it. Um, but especially when it comes to things like, you know, uh, depression and anxiety. And again, obviously there's a million root causes. So again, I don't mean to overgeneralize, but I feel like a lot of times, at least in my own experiences with it myself and, and with other people that I know that have experienced it, it, it's actually more in line with what you're talking about. with you know, needing, to, um, needing to kind of face things that they're not comfortable facing or needing to, to kind of look at, at their life and their, you know, the patterns and things that they're in, um, to, to kind of break out of that. And again, I don't mean to say that that's literally the only you know way that it works, but, um, but yeah, I, I, either way, your, your explanation makes sense. Yeah. The coaching is also, you know, and, and it's also being deeply listened to, which mm -hmm. I think is one of the tools that overlaps it's, and people don't get that a lot this day and age. And I think that is something that you do as someone who interviews people, you listen deeply. Um, and that can really bring out the best in a person. And I think that's something that, that coaches do. And the coaching, the coaching dynamic is a, very much centered in positive psychology. Mm -hmm. So certainly we have to face things about ourselves. That's, that's definitely true. But sometimes um, we're blind to what we're doing right. Sure. So that's something a coach can reflect back to you. Um, yeah, you stuck to your plan and you, you, and you exercised. You said you were going to do three times a week. You did two. That's two more than last week. Congratulations. Right. Yeah, no, that, that's, a, that's a really excellent point and something that, um, that I think is lost sight of a lot is the, 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 the value of, of, of <laughs> positive reinforcement, you know, um, the way that we that everyone universally agrees that you should train dogs, but <laughs> right. people don't apply that to people, <laughs> even though. Right. You know. People need treats too. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair. Um, so how did you kind of, or yeah, how, how did you kind of just, you know, find that this was kind of your path to, to, to start helping people out and this kind of stuff? How did you kind of fall into this? Well, I, I've always been sort of a seeker. I've always been a seeker. Um, and I'm interested in deep conversations and um, people's values and what really motivates people. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I did, you know, study a lot of positive psychology and um, and also I have my um, I have my bachelor's degree in comparative religion. So mm. that that sort of taking in what different cultures hold is valuable. Um, spirituality because that's a that's an important part of the whole person if you're if you're helping the whole person um what what is their belief system what what comforts them um and that's how that's one of the things that i would just read about and be interested in in my free time 
Um, and then I found functional medicine mm -hmm. because I wanted to help people be, it, it's hard to be your best self, um, be a loving parent or, a, a, you know, have a great career if you're sick, if you don't feel right. Well. Right. And so I guess to sum it up, I, I wanted to lead my best life and I looked into it and learned a lot about it over the years. And then I felt the call to really help other people lead their best life. And then I trained with um, the Functional Medicine Coaching Academy and became a Functional Medicine Certified Health Coach. And that gave me the, the sort of the, the, the background to, to hone in on, on health and wellness. Yeah. And so have, have you always worked at like led your own, I don't know if it's called a practice like it is for a doctor's office, but have you always led your own thing or have you worked with other, other coaches in, in the business or? So far, um, it's been my own practice, just me. I am now trained to work with other functional medicine providers. So doctors who practice functional medicine mm -hmm. will, um, will work with a functional medicine, um, certified health coach. They'll, they send their, their clients to them, their patients to them. And because they know that I'm trained in the philosophy and, you know, these days when you go to the doctor and they don't have the traditional doctors don't really have much time to spend. They right. have maybe five minutes per patient. I think mm -hmm. was the last, um, functional medicine places a high priority on gathering the patient's story. That's when you make sense of it. That's when you find the root causes. So they use coaches to check in, continue a dialogue, discover more information. Um, and that's what really gives the quality of care. So that is huh. something I'm looking into, but I haven't done it yet. Well, that's really interesting. Um, and yeah, I was going to ask that earlier when you were talking about kind of the, the overlaps between, you know, again, kind of a traditional therapist or counselor versus a coach. Have you ever had that kind of relationship with a counselor or coach with a particular patient where you were able to collaborate and kind of, you know, double team, uh, trying to help, help somebody. That's that I've done that with, um, with some of my coursework, but I oh. haven't, I haven't done that yet. Um, I graduated in September. Oh, okay. So I am looking forward to doing that. I, I have certain <laughs> clients who, because I am not trained to practice medicine. So if I am working closely with a client and, and they're talking about supplements and things like that. I always refer them, make sure they're seeing a doctor, even if it isn't a functional medicine doctor and making sure they're running everything by their doctor. And that so that there's some oversight there. Right. And that's gone well. I've not, I've not had, you know, that's, that's been a workable system so far. Nutritionist also would be someone I would work with because I'm not also not, not going to do a, a you know, calculated diet plan. Right. Right. No, that makes sense. Yeah, I just, it, you know, I, I just think it's all really interesting. Um, it's, it, 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 I've been, you know, kind of cursory level aware of, of these kinds of things being available, but, um, you know, Stacy probably was the first conversation I've had with someone who's a coach that was really that long and, and kind of in depth of a conversation. Um, and yeah, I just think, I think it's all really fascinating. I, I was watching, uh, there's a, another podcast called the Joe Rogan podcast, which is one of the most <laughs> popular podcasts, much like the walk show. I'm, I'm kidding, but, um, <laughs> I'm a big fan of walk show. So. Oh, well, thank you. You're very, you're very generous. <laughs> um, and, and anyway, and he had this guy on who was talking about how the, um, you know, in America, the placebo effect is looked at as a negative thing. So if, if someone takes a sugar pill and they feel better and then they're told it was a sugar pill, then it's like, oh, well, it's not real medicine. It didn't really help. And it was a trick. And and his point was that, you know, in some other cultures and, and this guy's own mind, he doesn't really understand that because it's like, if you feel better, then isn't that really what the goal should be? And so if you were able to feel better without having to take some other substance and you really could just take a placebo, like, isn't that actually a bigger win? Um, and, and I just thought that was really fascinating because I, I think that, you know, especially in, in the U S you know, and I'm not a science denier or anything like that. I believe in <laughs> climate change. I can't even believe that's a statement I have to make, but, 
But so it's not that I don't think that science is valid or that the scientific method is is reasonable or anything like that. But when it comes to medicine, people in our society, it's 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 almost as if you know traditional medicine is treated as if it's it's identical to our understanding of like you know physics or something, and it's just not. Um, we we just don't know how a lot of things work, and and you you experience that if you go to a hospital or if you go to get treatment from a doctor for a lot of things. And, and again, not that all doctors are bad or anything like that either, but I guess my point is just that I think there's a lot of room, a lot more room for the kinds of things that you're talking about and the kinds of approaches that you're talking about that can help people find solutions that aren't embedded in, you know, tests and and drugs. <laughs> Absolutely. And I'm, that's something that I find so exciting is, is the, the, the willingness now of people to explore the mind body connection because it's huge. And mm -hmm. the wonderful thing about the placebo effect is there's no side effect. Right. All these right. medications that interact and you know, that every, every cure has a little bit of poison in it. So if you can have something that doesn't have a side effect, like um, the mind body connection, then Yes. Use it. Use it. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I think that people, I think that side effects have also become trivialized in the last 20 years. And I'm sure there's a variety of reasons, but when I think of it, the thing that really jumps out to me is like when I was a kid in, you know, in the nineties, there was no, there, there weren't pharmaceutical ads. I mean, you had commercials for like Aleve and NyQuil and stuff like that, but you didn't have prescription drug commercials and now that you know i don't actually know what the share is but it feels like it's you know two-thirds of the ads on on tv are for prescription drugs that you have to ask your doctor about and then they rattle off a hundred side effects that some of them sound awful but they do it in a really fast kind of low tone voice and and i think that it's kind of conditioned people to not really consider those things. And, you know, I, I have someone very close to me that was on a, a variety of medicines, um, or dare we call them that, uh, drugs um, for, 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 you know, trying to deal with depression and anxiety and, and some other things like that. And, and this person eventually felt like they had, I mean, was diagnosed with having neuropathy, uh, had terrible balance, had horrible pain in their legs all the time, uh, had insane vision issues where their vision would just start scrolling. And it actually turned out that, that, and, and again, you know, we were going to doctors for it and everything. And, and then once we actually got uh, off of those medications, all of those symptoms went away. Like turns out not, doesn't have neuropathy, turns out can balance, turns out doesn't have crazy scrolling vision issues. And and we would have never guessed, and certainly no medical professional ever suggested that maybe this was a complication of those drugs. Um, but after witnessing that, I I am now very skeptical <laughs> of drugs. Agreed. Um, because you just you know again that's my point is like people act like it's this hard science that where everything is already defined, and it's not. You know, it's a it's a lot of guessing. It is. And science is valuable and functional medicine doctors are doctors. Um, right. But also they take, in, take into consideration that as far as science goes, you, you can't really possibly test every single drug for every single interaction with, with a combination of different drugs. It's, it's too much. Mm -hmm. um, and people are individuals. And this is something that's often forgotten. Um, people react differently to different kinds of medications. So um, yeah, and the forgotten element, which is one of the, the things that I, I have a passion for, is food. So if yes. I remember my statistics, I think doctors get four hours of nutrition training in their medical career. <laughs> right? That's insane. <laughs> yeah. So, and now with, with they're learning so much about how important gut health is, um, mm -hmm. And the, the role it plays in not just like digestive problems or, but also, um, also something like some things like depression, um, and anxiety, um, and that leaky gut syndrome can cause a host of, of problems in, in that don't, that wouldn't seem to be related to the gut. It's not a digestive problem. And they're just now sort of 
it's catching on to that. It's, and it's very important stuff to, to go with the, the, the easiest thing that will have the least side effects, very impactful and looking at each individual as a, as a, a unique person, um, not a number in some test. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, you know, that's something that I've always been kind of keenly aware of. Um, you know, my mom is a type one diabetic and, and also a dietitian for her career. So, you know, very, very focused on nutrition, both, you know, personally and professionally. Um, and, and, and so I've always been very aware, you know, cause she always really stressed the importance of, of having, you know, a good diet and, and, and eating a variety of foods and eating healthy foods. And, and then also something that she always did when she was working as a dietitian that I thought was really cool was she was really, she really focused a lot on helping people identify alternative foods. So it's like, well, if your diet says that you can't have X anymore and you don't like the alternative that's been proposed, which you know we'll call Y, <laughs> um, she, she might be able to find, you know, a Z and say, Hey, this has a lot of the same benefits that, you know, that thing Y did that you didn't want. And so now why don't we try that instead? And, and really helped a lot of people kind of enhance their, their, you know, enrich their lives, frankly, because eating is <laughs> a fundamental part of being alive, obviously. So um, I think that makes a lot of sense, you know, talking about the the focus on nutrition or the emphasis on that um, and how it actually just relates to, to more than just someone's appearance or weight or blood pressure, or, you know, whatever the case may be. Exactly. I mean, food is, like you said, it's about, um, connections and tradition, um, family, um, your culture, it's, it's, it's vital. And the mm -hmm. way that we eat, not just the foods that we eat, but who do you eat with? Um, that's essential. It's, it's important. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, that's been a, a, you know, a, a struggle of mine, I guess you could say, or a, I don't even want to use the word struggle, but a, a challenge maybe, um, in, in my own life of trying to, to manage my weight and be healthier is that one of the primary ways that I engage with my friends is to go grab lunch, or go grab dinner, you know what I mean? Somewhere. And, you know, certainly there are definitely now more choices than ever, but it, it can be challenging to find, you know, healthy food when you go out to eat. I mean, you know, it seems like almost everything is cooked in oil and <laughs> served with rice and noodles or bread or whatever, you know what I mean? And, um, and so, yeah, you're right. It is, it, it is important, not just because we need it to literally survive, but also because it does have all these other tie-ins to social connections and, and, and things like that, like you were just saying. Yeah. Eating out can be challenging and yeah, it's recreational too. And you're strongly influenced by your social group. It's really hard to to buck the trend when you're with a group of friends and you have a certain way that they all eat. It's it's difficult to be different. And I like what you were saying about your mom um, providing alternatives. I think that's really really key because it's it's not so much about cutting out, right? That's, right. You know, nature loathes a vacuum, right? So it's not even about stopping a bad habit. A really good way to stop a bad habit is to replace it with a positive habit rather than so rather than focusing on what you're cutting out, what you're not eating, where you're not going. Um, you add something that's helpful and, and you sort of push out and don't leave room for what you're trying to leave behind. Yeah, that's really that's a really interesting point. It so I just recently finished reading this book called The Power of Habit, and I, I talked about it a bit last week. I heard a podcast episode. on that. Yeah, I like well, that. Well, yeah. So in 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 that then, and I don't know how much I I talked about this specific point, but um, in the book it, it it makes that exact point that you just did that it's like the habits have to like the the, the most effective way. Like you can certainly develop a new habit, but the old habit doesn't ever actually go away. And so really the the best way or the most effective way if possible is to do exactly what you just said, identify what the trigger is, identify what the reward is, and then whatever that habit is in the middle that's taking you from trigger to reward, find a way to turn that into something that's that's positive so that it's not this detrimental thing. 
and then you're not, you know, you're not trying to swim upstream, <laughs> trying to change these behaviors all the time. Exactly. Um, exactly. And you can, fo- you can be more focused on, um, on something positive rather than on the feelings of like loss or, or deprivation. Right. So, um, you live in the, in the new England area. Is that correct? I live in, uh, I live in New York. I live in Brooklyn. New York. Oh, yeah. okay. Yeah. And so do you, do you primarily work with people local to that area? I guess not. Cause why would I ask that you work with Stacy and I know that she doesn't live in Brooklyn. <laughs> right. That's one of the wonderful things about this, um, about this job that I love is that I can work with people from all over. Um, and it's, you know, technology these days makes it very easy. And I, um, I let people choose what form of communication they're most comfortable with. Um, and lots of people seem to, to like the good old fashioned phone call. So that's what I've been doing most of my coaching on. Gotcha. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like, um, I mean, you know, certainly in the modern age, you know, it's more common even among close friends and family members to text way more than a call. Um, and then once you get outside of that and you get into any sort of, professional communication or, or even just, you know, larger social groups where you maybe don't have those closer connections. Certainly it's almost all written electronic communication, whether it be email or text or, or whatever the case may be. Right. Um, and it there, and, and, you know, I certainly participate in that world as well. I mean, <laughs> you and I texted and emailed before, you know, we re- recorded. So not that I think that it's an evil thing or that it doesn't work, but there is certainly a lot of nuance lost in in the written communication that's, that's just, you know, not there. Um, and so that makes sense that the talking, talk, being able to talk to people, uh, is really kind of the, the, the way that you're able to accomplish that. Well, I think that human connection is Mm -hmm. part of what people are missing these days too. And Mm -hmm. that, that feeling of being deeply heard and listened to, and just feeling someone being present for you. Um, I use text and email of course, in between sessions, um, to check in, see how things are, are progressing for support. Um, and the, my client will set up the parameters of how they want to do that. Maybe they want to show me they, a photo of their meal. That's one of their accountability steps that they take. Um, or if I know that something is coming up in their life, that's, um, important, I can, you know, shoot them a text and say, good luck with that. I know you, I know you can do it. Um, Stacy did that for me today, which I thought was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's all forms of technology um, to serve a greater purpose, which is connection. Yeah. Yeah. And I also thought it was, was interesting um, and, and reasonable, but that, that, you know, Stacy is a coach and then, uh-huh. but simultaneous to that, she still finds value in having a coach herself. So it's not as if it's something that you only could benefit from if, you're at your lowest point or something. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, absolutely. Coaches, um, coaches need to be coached and coaches believe in coaching. That's why they do it. And (laughs) self care is um, essential. If you're in any kind of helping profession, Uh, you have to be centered and grounded and taken care of and well and healthy yourself. If you're going to help anyone else get there, it's, it's like, you know, it's, it's like when, you throw someone the, the life preserver, you don't jump in after them, right? Right, right, right. Yeah, that makes sense.
kind of an, a random question, but just because I've been reading some books lately, do you have any, are there any books or anything that you suggest that, that kind of, that you found inspiring or, or, you know, educational and kind of learning more about this, this sort of stuff? Well, well I'm an avid reader. Um, and I knew I was in the right profession when I got <laughs> my textbooks and I was like, I would totally read this in my free time. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a great indicator. Yeah. <laughs> right. Um, so right now I'm reading coaching psychology, which is like basically the, the manual, but as far as uh, books for just people, once again, I'm, I'm, I'm into the whole person. So I love the book, The Artist's Way. Have you ever read that? Mm, I haven't. It's really fun. Um, Julia Cameron, I believe, is the author. Um, it's been around a minute, but it, I love the premise that everyone's an artist right? in some way, in some form. Mm -hmm. You have something to give. You're, you're, you're here to share some special thing that's only inside of you that no one else can give. And this book helps you tap into how to share that. Um, so it's a, it's a series of um, exercises and uh, to help you tap into your, your inner artist. So I, I just happen to love that book. Yeah, that does sound really cool. And I, I, I that I'm going to, I'm definitely going to check that out uh, and, and really suggest, you know, any listeners to, to also, and the reason I say that even before reading it, but just because of that premise is that, I have found, you know, I, 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 and I've talked about this on other episodes, but you know, when I was like 20, I did stand up comedy briefly and then didn't do it for about a decade. And then when I was, you know, 30, 31, did it again. And I, I really hoped that it would be this like movie moment where I would get on the stage and, and like, I would have some feeling where I would be like, Oh, this is my calling. This is what I'm supposed to do. And it just didn't, it just didn't really happen. Um, but I, I didn't continue pursuing it either. And so maybe that would have come just with more time and, and you know, and more, more time around it. But this year, you know, cause I, I just started the, this podcast in January of, of 2019. And I, it wasn't until after I had started the podcast and, and made some episodes that I realized how much of a void I had without having a creative outlet, which is really, I think what you're kind of speaking to in, in the idea that everyone's an artist is like, everyone has the capacity to create something. And to be frank, I mean, even if my podcast <clears throat> never becomes the Joe Rogan podcast, even if it's never at the top of the charts, I don't really care. I mean, I think that would be great. And it would be cool if I could do it, you know, full time or something. But even if not, um, it's just been a really, really rewarding experience to, to have this creative outlet. Um, I remember I was jealous of other people for so long <laughs> who would have this passion. Like I have a, a, I used to have a roommate who now has a master's degree in, in creative writing. And when he first started going to school for that, he was so obsessed with writing. And I was so envious that I didn't have anything that motivated me that way, you know? Um, and so I just think that there is such a value in finding something that, that a person can be passionate about. And, and, you know, to some extent that's said a lot and there's kind of a cliche to it, but I've also come to realize that some things that are cliches, not all, but some things that are cliches are cliches because they're actually just true. <laughs> and right. There's just not a better way to say it. You know, there's not a more succinct way to put it out there. Um, no, it's true. And, and you, you get to define being, being passionate, having a passion is one of the most important things in life and you get to define what success is to you and you don't have to earn your right to create. Right. Yeah, no, I mean, when I started the podcast, I had never, you know, obviously, like I said, I'd done stand up, so I've spoken into a microphone before, but I've never recorded. I've never edited. I've never tried to come up with topics. I've never interviewed guests. I've never, you know, <laughs> I've never done any of this stuff uh, and just kind of jumped in and just, you know, said whatever. And yeah, it, like I said, it's just been, it's been so rewarding. I mean, I even started a second podcast. That's a, a video game podcast called pick up your sticks, but you know, at, at the beginning of January of this year or any time prior to my, you know, in my life, I, I wouldn't have thought that I was going to have one podcast this year and certainly not two. Um, and yeah, it's just been a really rewarding experience. So, and what do you think motivated you to take that that leap to jump in and do it? Um, 
it, it was a combination of things, you know, and, and I've, I've also found in life that that's also true, that things aren't really black and white. Usually there's, there's a lot of gray area and a lot of nuance, but um, it really, you know, I had kind of had thoughts because I had a, uh, I really like podcasts. I, and I really like long form conversation podcasts. Um, and really that's because before podcasts, I just like, I actually just like watching interviews or listening to interviews, which is kind of a strange <laughs> hobby. Um, but, you know, like to watch like a, a 60 minutes interview and, and those are a little less satisfying because the, even the long segments of those are maybe 15 or 20 minutes. But um, he's now disgraced. But Charlie Rose, he used to have like a, a PBS show that was like an hour long. I used to watch that. Yeah. Yeah. And I really enjoyed you know, I really enjoyed that stuff. And so I kind of had it in my head, but I was like, well, I don't know what I would talk about because I'm, I'm not an expert on anything. So I'm not like teaching anyone <laughs> stuff and I don't have a business to promote. A lot of podcasts are kind of a, almost a, like a marketing tool to promote, you know, another line of business that already exists. Um, and, and so I just didn't really know what I would, what I would do. And then I had a friend come to me and she explained that, um, that she thought I should absolutely start a podcast. And there's another guy named Dak Shepard, who's a, a celebrity, Yeah, but, but he has a podcast called the armchair expert, which is, I guess, kind of themed like this show is where he just kind of has people on and talks to him. Now he, I think mostly interviews other celebrities, but, um, but yeah, there's not really a, you know, there's not an objective other than to just have an interesting conversation or have a fun conversation. <laughs> other people can decide if it's interesting. And, uh, and she said that what she really liked about him was that he was very, um, he was able to be very vulnerable. And so the way she kind of tried to describe it was she was like, if he has to, if he feels a certain way about something and then eventually feels a different way about it, he can walk the listeners, you know, his audience through his entire progression of how he got there. And she was like talking about herself. She was like, I can't do that, you know, and it, it's not, she's like, I just, I don't know. I just don't operate that way. Like I could tell you how I felt on day one and then how I felt differently on day two, but trying to walk people through how I got to that doesn't really work. And then said that she thought that I did that, that I had that kind of a similar vulnerability um, to myself. And so she thought that it wouldn't matter what the topic was, that it would be interesting. And I found that very flattering. <laughs> so combined with my own like of podcasts and being flattered, uh, and then actually, and this is more negative, I guess, but what actually was like the day when I ordered the microphone and, and said, we're doing it was, uh, was I, I work a nine to five, you know, corporate job and it's a, it truly is a great job. However, that particular day as happens in all jobs and probably all walks of life, regardless of how you make money. But, um, I got really, really frustrated because I felt like I had put a lot of work into something and then was just very casually dismissed. And I found that so, so frustrating. And so I was like, you know what, I'm going to do a podcast so that I can put all of myself into something mm -hmm. and no one else can dismiss it because no one else is in charge of it. You know what I mean? Like it's my own thing that I get to be in control of. And, you know, certainly listeners could not tune in and, and whatever, but but that doesn't mean that I can't make the show still. Um, and so it was kind of a confluence of all those different things that, that kind of led me to that moment where I was like, all right, we're going, we're going for it. Um, and yeah. So. I love that. <laughs> so you had a friend who was able to strength spot for you. She was able to say, Hey, you have the skill. And sometimes we have blind spots to our own skills. Um, and then you wanted something to, to have ownership over that belonged right. to you, the work that belonged to you. Yeah. Right, right. And I don't, you know, I think though that minus any of those, you know, obviously if I'd never heard of podcasts then I probably wouldn't have wanted to do one, <laughs> but, but even outside of that, like if I had just gotten upset at work, I mean, that's not the first time I've had that sentiment at, at you know, different jobs I've had throughout my life. And so if it had just been that sentiment alone, I don't know that it would have motivated me or I, I would have taken that action. And when she gave me that feedback, you know, I didn't, in that moment start either. So it, it kind of, that's why I say it, it was kind of, you know, it's nuanced. It took a lot of things. It took several different things kind of building together and, and yeah, kind of led to that.
That's interesting. Yeah, that it took a it took a, <laughs> a fortuitous coming together of um, yeah. something that was pleasant that felt pleasant and something that was unpleasant. And right. Yeah, I think um, having our work have meaning, and that doesn't always you know it doesn't always has to have to come necessarily from your career. Right. Um, you, there's all kinds of ways to do meaningful work and and have ownership over over your own creation. Um, that's kind of why, kind of why I like that, like the, the artist way that it gives you step by step. And I love step by step instructions and exercises. Yes. I love exercises, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I'll have to, I'll definitely have to to check that out. Um, I, yeah, I, I, it, it's just so interesting how, I, like, I, I refer to them. Um, one of my close friends refers to them as hints, but. I, so I guess that's probably the easiest word is, is just hints, but it's just, it's so interesting to me how I, I've seen, started seeing these different ideas like, you know, the power of habit book that I read or discipline equals freedom. And then, and then, or I, I also did a podcast on how to win friends and influence people, which is really actually just about being empathetic and communicating with people. And, and a huge part of it is what you've been saying a lot is, listening to people. Um, I always thought that that book was going to be a book about like how to trick people or something, but it's not at all that. But anyway, so I, you know, I go through those, those things and then I encounter Stacy and now, and I knew Stacy before, but I had no idea that that side of Stacy existed, you know, the, the coach and all this and, and then have a really interesting conversation with her. And now, <laughs> now here you come along and I, you know, I, we don't know each other <laughs> prior to, to, to meeting through Stacy. And, and now here it is like, even though you don't know me at all, your all the things that you're talking about just directly correlate with all this stuff. It, it's just a, a weird, I guess, kind of synchronicity. That was the word I was going to say. Yeah. Carl, yeah <laughs> synchronicity. It all, it all starts to, to fit into place. If you pay attention to the little hints, I like that the little hints. Um, yeah. I have, I have, if some, if more than one person recommends a book to me, the same book, I just know that I'm meant to, to read it or right. an idea keeps coming up over and over again. It's in the zeitgeist. It's like, I, I think it's speaking. And when you follow the little steps, you don't always have to know exactly how it's going to turn out, but it usually ends up someplace fun. Um, like this conversation, yes. it ends up someplace exciting. Yeah. Yeah, no, I agree. It, it was interesting. A buddy of mine, this was, I don't know, probably within the last two years we're talking and he had like, he had gone to this seminar and it turned out that he was the only person that showed up to the seminar. It was like at a public library on a weeknight or something. Well, he was the only attendee. Well, it turned out that the person who was delivering the seminar had known my buddy's mom. And so this guy actually knew my buddy when he was a little kid. Oh, wow. And so then he starts talking to the guy and explains who he is. And then the guy is really excited because of course he remembers, you know, his mom and, remembers him when he was a little, little boy. And, and it, and then, you know, now instead of having a seminar that was this prepared thing, since he was the only one, he just got to sit down and have a conversation with this guy and just talk to this, this person who was the presenter. And, and he was telling me about it. And he was, he was like, it feels like it was like set up or something, you know, like it feels like a, like a movie, you know, like, it, yeah. like it feels, and he was like, but I know that that's not, He's like, I don't, I don't intellectually actually think that there's some force guiding me or whatever. And, and we talked about it and the conclusion that we kind of came to is it was like, you know, we don't have any way to prove that there is a force or that there isn't, but really instead of trying to deconstruct this and find out how maybe it's not actually magical or how maybe how it's not actually that cool, like isn't it just the word you just use? Isn't it just way more fun to just lean into it and just go with it? You know, I mean, it doesn't mean that he has to completely upend all of his practical <laughs> things that he does in his life to also accept that like, Hey, you know, sometimes things happen that you don't really have a good explanation for. And that just because you don't have a good explanation for it doesn't mean that you have to find a way to unexplain it or a way to make it not meaningful. 
um, just enjoy the fact that it's meaningful. You know, just enjoy the fact that it's <laughs> it's exciting when it is. Exactly, exactly. It um, you don't have to you don't have to dissect it. Um, and if something is is working, it's a little like the placebo, right? If something right. is working, um, isn't that enough? So, uh, what is the what is the name of, of your business? Um, my, this is fun. Okay, my business is called um, the Queen Beyond the Wall. So, Ashley Thomas Coaching. Um, and the reason that I picked that was um, I I want to help people connect with a grander vision of themselves. So, mm. walls can be they can make you feel safe. You can get comfortable behind them. Um, But sometimes there comes a point when you want to move beyond the blocks um, and the limitations that maybe you don't even remember how it got built or what you're keeping in or keeping out, right? And it's Mm -hmm. time to move on. And sometimes you need some help to move beyond the walls. And the person that you meet out there, I deal a lot with women. That's my niche is women who in transition. So women going through divorce or a, a layoff career change, empty nest that want um, to use that experience to level up to their best self. So the queen beyond the wall is the metaphor for the you, you, you have inside your, your ultimate self that you're looking to become. That's awesome. Um, and so if, if people were wanting to like reach out to you to maybe see if, if you would be a good fit to, to be a coach for them, how would they go about reaching out to you? I have a Facebook business page, um, and it's at Ashley Thomas coaching and they can see, uh, read a little bit about that philosophy. Um, there's going to be a guided meditation, um, to connect with the, the queen beyond the wall. So you, you can sort of imagine yourself as her and then take the steps to create it. Oh, okay. That's cool. Yeah. That's something that I had never really, um, had never really done was meditation and have started doing that in the last few months. And yeah, there's just tremendous value to it. Uh, I was, I've been very surprised at how, which I don't know why I'm surprised. There's, you know, millions of people that do it daily. So it's, it's it's not like I just found out about it or something, but, uh, but I did just kind of discover it for myself, I guess you could say. So, right. You're doing the practice. What is your practice like? Um, you mean, as far as like, what do I actually do when I meditate? Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I usually just try and, and, you know, cut the lights out or whatever, and, and just be in a comfortable position. And I really actually don't do a a mantra or anything. Um, I've done ones like that, but anymore, I find that I really just try and focus on my breathing and just focus on, you know, breathing in and and taking a large deep breath and then, you know, focusing on the exhale. And and anytime my mind wonders, you know, it it certainly happens a lot. I'm not, (laughs) I'm no monk, Um, but I will then try and kind of like, that's what I use to kind of recenter the mind and get back, get back to the, the, the space, if you will, is just to go back to focusing on the breathing. So a, a thought comes in and sometimes it's entertained for <laughs> way longer than I meant for it to be. Uh, and then I'll catch myself and then, you know, back to the the center, if you will, of, of just the, the in and out breathing. I love that. So you're doing a, you're doing a mindfulness practice. Um, oh, okay. Yeah. And, and the practice is the practice. So yes, the mind is going to wander and bringing it back. That's, that's meditation. And that's, that's really, that's really all it is. Um, and it gives you, it creates a little space, right? A little space between the thoughts. Um, Mm -hmm. and that's where the magic is, which also sort of comes into when you were talking about habit, 
and I mm -hmm. forget how you described it, but you were talking about um, the the sort of the the trigger, the cue mm -hmm. when the mindfulness meditation is going to give uh, give you lots of um, space practice at stopping and noticing the cue or the trigger, because that's sort of what mindfulness is. You notice that you're getting triggered or you notice that um, you have a craving. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, which, so there's a book you might like too, that's on my favorite list um, called mindfulness and character strengths. Um, and that was one that I, that was, that I read for school as well. And it is, I'm trying to see if I can find who wrote it, but um, that's, that's ties in some of the benefits of uh, meditation practice and, and strengthening, um, finding your key strengths and tapping into them with mindfulness. Uh, it's, it's a really powerful book. Yeah. Well, and that's, so yeah, mindfulness and character strengths is where you said the name of that is. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, yeah, I'll look it up after our show and I'll, I'll, I'll make sure and include a link to that and as well as the artist way in the show notes. So anyone that's interested can, can have a link to go pick it up. It's by um, Ryan Nemec. Okay. N I E M I E C. Alrighty. Um, but what you said about the, you know, the, the, the mindfulness meditation practices that, that, that is, that is the whole, that's the whole thing is that it is the practice of the mind wonders and you bring it back and the mind wonders and you bring it back. And it, it's interesting because the reason that I hadn't ever really committed to it before, well, that's probably not a fair thing to say. <laughs> the justification I used <laughs> for why I hadn't committed to it before um, was because I I thought that to meditate was to like sit for hours on end if you chose and say om and be like this monk like character, you know, it's some stereotype I have in my head. And and I never could do that. I never even got close to that. And so I thought, well, I just don't know how to do it or I'm just not doing it correctly. And now when I've just actually committed to the routine and it's just something I do, you know, daily, I, I've actually found that that I certainly still am not <laughs> not this Zen like character, but that I have found the value in in the practice of just the mind wondering. It's almost like kind of like lifting weights with your mind. Like it's exactly like that. It is. Yeah. And, and so then it's like, well, maybe someday I get to some more, you know, Zen like state or whatever, but, but even if not, now I understand the value of it, but I never would have understood that if I hadn't have just done it. Like it was, on, I only learned that after actually doing it consistently for a period of time and then being like, Oh, maybe this is what I was supposed to just be doing the whole time. <laughs> right. You just show up. It's like yoga. You just show up on the mat and you breathe and just breathe with whatever, with whatever comes up. But yeah, so many people say, I, I, I tried meditation. I can't. Well, if you tried, yes. if you, tried you did. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's hard because we're so, we're so goal oriented. Um, and yes. you, know, you want the, you want the payoff and you want to get good at it. And sometimes accepting that that's not, the way it's going to be is, is the, the goal. If there's a goal. <laughs> right. Right. Well, and I think especially in, you know, in the, the social media and internet culture, but probably just U S culture in general, even before that um, there's just, there's also just a lot of fake ideas. Like I keep referencing this monk or whatever. I've never been to somewhere where there's monks. <laughs> I don't actually know that, you know, I'm just, I'm just referencing something I've seen in movies or something. You know? Exactly. <laughs> and so then there's all these unrealistic expectations that we have that aren't actually grounded in anything. And then sometimes I, you know, myself, especially I, I, I look at those as, as reasons why I shouldn't try something because I'm afraid of it because it's like, well, I'm not going to be that. And it's like, well, that's not what it is. <laughs> no one is that. So. No one is that. There's a book called 10% happier too. That's um, about um, a, a, journalist who was trying to overcome panic attacks um and he talks a lot about his sort of his sort of love hate with uh with meditation i think you might find it amusing because i think you might be able to relate to it <laughs> <laughs> yeah I'll, I'll definitely check that out 10 percent happier yeah uh well this is this is good because you're giving me a reading list i i i've read a few books and then 
most recently I started reading Malcolm Gladwell's latest book, Talking to Strangers. I don't know if you're a fan of his or not. Oh, I'll have to uh, check that out. This is great. We're exchanging reading lists. I'm, I yeah. love to read. It's, it's you know, it's my favorite, one of my favorite things. So. Yeah, I, Malcolm Gladwell, I just I just love as an, as an author and, a, and as a speaker. That's actually where I discovered him was on YouTube do, doing presentations or he did he's done a couple of TED Talks. Um, and I just find him to be a really, really fascinating character and his writing is very similar to how he speaks. And, um, so yeah, so, but anyway, so I'm reading that book now, but I'm, I don't know, two thirds the way through it or something. And I was like, I don't know what I'm going to read next. And now I've got, now I've got some options here. So this is good. <laughs> yeah. I may be overloading you. What is Malcolm Gladwell's niche? Like, what does he, what does he do? Does he um, he, he, he tries to look at things that 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 society thinks they understand and and the and then tries to explore why maybe it doesn't actually work that way so like for example um he has probably his most uh his oh man now now that of course now that the name of it is escaping me i'm just gonna actually google it because i need to know right. <laughs> the name of the book. <laughs> Oh, there it is. Outliers. So, so his, probably my favorite book of his, I don't know if it's his most popular or not. He has six books, I think. Um, but is, is called Outliers, the story of success. And so it's, it's basically this idea that people have where like, oh, Mozart is a genius or, um, Steve Jobs was a genius or Bill Gates was a genius or, or whatever. Like people are born with these gifts and no one else could replicate it because they weren't they weren't blessed with the same thing basically and and he looks at a, a wide variety of the most successful people and really what he finds and demonstrates through various examples is uh that that's not actually the case like not that there's not talent and not that the people don't have perhaps a special gift so it's not to diminish that but like mozart wrote a masterpiece when he was 16 but he started composing when he was six. Right. So he's 10 years in, you know, like, so if you just look at composer writes masterpiece at 16, it's like, oh, well, huh, genius prodigy. Well, not really. He's been doing it for a decade already. Or like the Beatles. He, he talks in that book about the Beatles and how when they were in before they became mega mega stars, they actually lived in Germany for I think it was like six months or something. And they played nightly at this club where they played between, I, I want to say it was like four to six hour shows, five nights a week. Well, they did that for, again, you know, five, six months before they ever started recording records and, and became the Beatles as we know them. And so it's the same kind of thing. Like they burst onto the scene and everyone's like, oh my God, hey, look at these prodigies, look at these geniuses. And again, not that they're not those things, but they also had actually just put in an enormous amount of work and practice playing together that most most bands don't have the opportunity to do because most bands don't have the opportunity to play five nights a week for four hours straight for six months. You know what I mean? Um, so it's just kind of, just kind of tipping ideas that, that we hold a society kind of on their head, like the talking to strangers that he's, that he's, I'm reading now that is his most recent book is um, kind of about how people think that we're good at, at reading strangers motivations but we're actually not. And and it actually kind of ties into what I was just talking about. One of the examples he he's citing is that people think that like, if, so if, if something sad that I, you know, that, that we agree is sad happens in your realm, but you don't act sad, then I'm going to be suspicious of that. But that's because I have this expectation of transparency that everyone's, you know, physical faces and reactions matches their emotional state. And it's actually just not true. But if you watch like a Friends episode, the really popular sitcom, well, in that you can, he actually <laughs> breaks down an example of where you can watch an episode of that show and follow it with the sound off because the trained actors are very good at being transparent. And so they're, the way they look and the way their, their faces look do match what the character is trying to express. But people in real life are not trained actors. And so people aren't always transparent yet. We attach so much value 
to these things that we just don't actually understand that well. Yeah, um, we have this idea or this image in our head. And it was funny because when you were mentioning the Buddhist monk that meditates and you said you don't even know where you got the image, maybe the movies, but it was the first time you mentioned it. I had a literal picture flash into my mind and maybe it's the same movie. Like human beings are born storytellers and yeah. we fill in the blanks, right? We make up a story yeah. about everything. Um, if someone, you know, we walk into a room and people are laughing and we're feeling self-conscious, we might make up a story about why they're all laughing at us. We have no, we have no idea. Um, one of the techniques that I use in coaching, um, one of the phrases that I try to use because um, I never want to make assumptions about what someone's telling me. Mm -hmm. So if I think I know what someone is saying, I will, or I think I know what's behind it, but I'm not sure. I'll, I'll tell them the story I'm making up is, and then fill in the blank that you're really angry at your husband and you don't want to express it. So you're eating. Does that sound true to you? Because I don't know. I'm, you know, I'm taking pieces of input of information, their tone of voice, other things right. they've said, and I'm making up a story and I want to give them the opportunity to tell me their story. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, yeah, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. Um, yeah. I, I, I highly would, would recommend uh, Malcolm Gladwell. He's, he's, all of his books are, are that kind of idea. And he actually also has a podcast, which I would recommend listening to uh, third after the walk show and, and pick up your stick. <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, but that's called revisionist history and it's exactly the same thing. He's going and looking at old events in history and then, and how it's perceived and then trying to understand like, is that really what happened or is that really what we're looking at? Um, and you know, the answer is always no, <laughs> that's not what really happened or that's not really how it actually played out. Um, well, I, I have really, really enjoyed speaking with you and I really, really enjoy uh, the, the work that you're doing and just learning about this and finding out about it. Um, so again, Ashley Thomas and the Queen Beyond the Wall, Ashley Thomas Coaching. Um, you can be found on Facebook at Ashley Thomas Coaching uh, and there's a guided meditation there. Um, and yeah, you know, if, if anyone, you know, listens to this and, and maybe isn't on Facebook or something, you know, if, they if can always got... email me at uh, okay. the queen beyond the wall at gmail.com. Okay. Love hearing from people. Awesome. Um, well, that is perfect. Cause I was going to say if, <laughs> if someone didn't have Facebook, they could email me and I would be happy to reach out to you on their behalf and get you guys in touch. So, uh, but I won't have to, to play middleman. They're welcome to just reach out to you directly. At the queen be on the wall at gmail.com right no you're going to be busy you have a lot of books to read <laughs> <laughs> this is true this is true um well again ashley thank you so much for for taking the time to join the show was there anything else that, that we hadn't gotten to that you wanted to cover this was so much fun thank you for having me um no i think we 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 went all around didn't we we got we got in a lot so that was great <laughs> awesome. you're lovely to talk to awesome well thank you you're very generous i appreciate it uh we'll see you next time all right All right, folks. Well, that is going to do it for today's show. Thank you again so much, Ashley Thomas, for joining the show today. Uh, and also thank you, Misha Zarens, for providing the music that we always use in all the walk show episodes. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed listening. I really appreciate it. And I hope you have a great week. See you next time.